The periodic table is a wonderful and very useful reference tool. We'll talk more about how we can use it in a little bit. It was first developed by Dmitry Mendeleev, and he recognized that there were properties of the elements that repeated. They had similar properties to each other, and he started laying out the table so that those properties um, were, were near each other. So be, by doing this, he was able to help predict that there would be unknown elements yet to be discovered. You may notice that this table is flipped on its side from the table that we currently know. So on the periodic table, we have something called periods. Periods are the horizontal rows. And the reason it's called a periodic table is because those in those periods, the properties repeat over and over. Because they repeat, that means that the vertical columns are grouped together in what is known as a group or a family. They have similar properties to each other the elements that are in the same vertical column. The reason for this is because they have the same number of valence electrons and the group number tells us the number of valence electrons. And valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost shell or the outermost energy level of the atom, similar to what we we're talking about in our Bohr model. So the one that's furthest from the nucleus. Valence electrons are extremely important because they help to determine the properties as well as the chemical reactions that our elements are going to undergo. The same number of valence electrons will have the same properties, which is why we call them families or groups. The periodic table also has larger groupings, such as the metals, which are the lower left-hand side of the periodic table, and nonmetals, which are the upper right-hand side. So if it's a metal, the properties that it exhibits are that it's hard, shiny, malleable, which means it's easy to shape, fusible, and ductile. Ductile means it's easy to stretch into wires. Metals also conduct heat and electricity very well. Nonmetals are elements, again, upper right hand corner, that are not metals and they exhibit properties that are opposite of metals. So they're typically soft, they don't conduct heat, and they don't conduct electricity. An example of that would be chlorine. Metalloids are elements that have properties that are a little bit like metals and a little bit like nonmetals. So we sometimes refer to these as semiconductors or electrical semiconductors. And this is why the metalloids typically are what we use for um, computer processors. Silicon is a good example as well as boron. On the periodic table, we typically number the group numbers in Roman numerals and the periods with numbers one through seven. Our metalloids are found on a diagonal line between our metals and our nonmetals. Starts at boron and stair steps down the periodic table. Our alkali metals are in the first column of the periodic table. These are very reactive metals and are not found as the element in nature. The alkali earth metals are in column two, a little less reactive. We have halogens on the right hand side and noble gases. So noble gases are very unreactive. They don't like to form compounds with other elements. And everything on the periodic table wants to be like the noble gases. 
The transition metals are in the shorter columns in the middle of our periodic table, as well as the two rows that sit underneath it. Group one, the alkali metals, have melting points that increase as we go up the column from the bottom to the top. They have one valence electron. The reactivity increases as we go down the column. So as we go down the column, it gets more and more reactive. They do form metal oxides. And the alkali metals include things like lithium that is used for batteries and antidepressants, sodium, which you're probably familiar with as sodium chloride, which is table salt, potassium, which is in fertilizers and soaps, rubidium and cesium, which are used for the atomic clock, and francium, which is radioactive. The alkali earth metals, the melting points are a little less predictable. They have two valence electrons. Again, the reactivity increases down the group. They do like to react with oxygen and halogens. And they're used in, you'll find them in places like emeralds for beryllium, your alloy wheels for magnesium, calcium is in your bones and in chalk. Strontium is used in fireworks and barium is used in glass making and it is also a poison. The halogens, they can be found in all three states. So they can be found as gases, liquids, or solids in, at room temperature. They form diatomic molecules, which means they bond to themselves, two atoms together. They all have seven valence electrons and their reactivity decreases as you go down the group. They get used in things like fluoride and toothpaste, chlorine and bleach, bromine is a fire retardant, and iodine gets used frequently as a disinfectant. The noble gases have a full outer shell of electrons. This is what makes them very unreactive. Helium has the lowest boiling point of any element at negative 269 degrees Celsius, just a little bit above absolute zero. They are used in neon signs. They Helium can be used in balloons. It's also used as a cryogen, which means it cools superconducting magnets. Neon, you'll find in signs. Argon gets used quite frequently in lasers. Krypton was used in camera flashes. And xenon is used as for medical imaging. So hopefully throughout this chapter, you've learned a little bit about the subatomic particles and who discovered them, some of their properties or characteristics, the how to represent an atom using a Bohr model, what the atomic symbols are and the information that we can gain from them, how the periodic table is laid out, and what represents different regions on the periodic table.